أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله المستكن في حجاب العمى والمستتر في غيب الصفات والأسماء الباطن المختفي بعز جلاله والظاهر الغير محتجب بنور جماله الذي بقهر كبريائه محجوب عن قلوب الأولياء وبظهور سنائه يظهر في مرائي الخلفاء والصلاة والسلام على أصل الأنوار ومحرم سر الأسرار المستغرق في غيب الهوية والممحى عنه التعينات السوائية أصلي أصولي حقيقة الخلافة وروحي أنواري منصب الولاية المستتر في حجاب عز الجلال والمخمر بيد الجلال والجمال كاشف رموز الأحدية بجملتها ومظهر الحقائق الإلهية برمتها المرآة الأتم الأمجد سيدنا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الشموس الطالعة من فلك الخلافة الأحمدية والبدور المنيرة من أفق الولاية المحمدية سيما خليفته القائم مقامه في الملك والملكوت المتحد بحقيقته في الحضرة الجبروت واللاهوت أصل الشجرة الطوبة وحقيقة سدرة المنتهى الرفيق الأعلى في مقامي أو أدنى معلم الروحانيين ومؤيد الأنبياء والمرسلين أمير المؤمنين أسد الله الغالب الإمام علي بن أبي طالب وعلى ابنه أبي الشهداء والصديقين النير بين النيرين ضياء الفرقدين سيدنا الحسين عليه وعلى المستشهدين بين يديه بأرض كرب وبلاء أفضل الصلاة والتسليم واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم إلى أبد الآبدين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد This is the first lecture in a series of six lectures, insha'Allah, to be devoted to the topic of the event and meaning of Karbala, especially in the light of the following verse from the Qur'an, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inni Ja'ilun Fil Ardi Khalifa. Indeed, I am placing therein upon the earth a khalifa. Allah is speaking in the first person. We are now in the 1442nd year of the Hijrah, which means that more than 1300 years have passed since the martyrdom of Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram in the year 61 of the Hijrah. It behooves us to pause and ask ourselves, why did this event happen? And what does it mean? The first is a question of history, and the second is a question 
of the meaning of history. In the following lectures, it shall be our task to shed some light on both dimensions, that is to say, the history of the Karbala and its meaning. The history of the Karbala event and its meaning. The message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as genuinely transmitted by his progeny, the Ahlul Bayt, remains despite the passage of 15 centuries little known. Often it is designated by the term Shia Islam or Shiism or Shiite Islam even. Whatever the designation, this genuine message of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as transmitted through his progeny, his household, the Ahl al-Bayt, continues to suffer between benign neglect and malignant distortion. The Arabic term Shia simply means partisan or supporter. And it originally took the form of Shi'atu Ali, the partisans or supporters of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in contradistinction to the partisans of Uthman ibn Affan who had already died by that time and thus these partisans of Uthman were led by none other than Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Sakhar ibn Harb ibn Umayyah, who was Uthman's kinman, kinsman, excuse me, being from the same clan of the Banu Umayyah. And we shall have more to say about this figure and others in the subsequent lectures. For now, suffice it to say that the term Shia is also often rendered, most unfortunately in the English language, as party, in the sense of a political party. And that is most unfortunate, for it gives the impression that the supporters of Ali were akin to a modern political party in some sort of a modern polity, in some sort of a modern nation-state, and nothing could be further from the truth. To read back into ancient Arabia modern notions of politics, which of course in our contemporary age is regarded as separate from religion, such a thing is to commit a grave error. A search on YouTube will yield several videos, if you search under difference between Sunni and Shia, for example, you will get a number of different videos that assert that the difference between Sunnis and Shi'is is about politics, which in the modern context simply means power, for that is what politicians pursue and hope to exercise. In a system of representative democracy, such power is presumably confirmed by the people through some means of suffrage, that is to say, through some system of voting and elections, and the winner of the most votes is thereby granted authority. Authority to rule. And all of this is enshrined in some notion of law, whether customary or formally promulgated in some sort of a written document like a constitution. But I would humbly submit that in order to understand the message and meaning of Karbala, one must look closely at the nature of authority, not as it exists now, but as it existed in ancient Arabia. 
the first point to emphasize is that uh, contemporary notions of two separate and divergent realms designated as sacred and secular represent an anomaly in human history. Such categorizations never existed in any traditional society, and ancient Arabia is no exception to this. The authority of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to put it in contemporary terms, was both spiritual and temporal, religious and political. Thus, Islam properly understood is both a religio-spiritual teaching as well as a socio-political movement. Ancient Arabian society was composed of both nomadic as well as sedentary groups. What both nomads and town dwellers had in common, however, was that they were both organized on a tribal basis. Both nomads and city or town dwellers had a social system that was based on the notion of tribe. Of all social bonds in this system, it was loyalty to one's tribe which was paramount. This tribal solidarity is called in Arabic asabiya, classical Arabic. This asabiya or sentiment of tribal solidarity as well as other aspects of tribal social structure are abundantly on display in pre-Islamic poetry, what is known as Al-Adab Al-Jahidi. Later day scholars of Arabic literature were fond of saying Al-Shi'ru Diwan Al-Arab. Poetry is the register of the Arabs. That is to say it was the register of their history, their culture, their traditions, their notion of identity, their remembered past. And it was through this medium of poetry that this um, cultural patrimony of the tribe was passed down from generation to generation. So there was a tradition in pre-Islamic Arabia of the composing of lengthy odes. O-D-E, ode is the correct word in English for the Arabic term qasida. Plural of qasida is qasaid. So there was a tradition of composing qasaid. In, and in each tribe there were poets, and uh, often there would be a top poet in a given tribe who would serve an almost, I would say, an almost, if we put it in modern terms, an almost religious function. And the word sha'ir in Arabic, which means poet, that's how we translate it, but it literally means someone who has shu'ur, someone who has a kind of um, awareness or consciousness and therefore an insight into the deep nature of things which that person, he or she, man or woman, there were female poets as well, extremely good ones, and, uh, that, and that person was able to, to, to verbalize this in a poetic medium of great beauty. That is what you mean by the term sha'ir and shi'r in Arabic. So these odes would be composed, and these are very lengthy literary documents, or very lengthy literary works. Um, they're often hundreds of verses long, and the classical qasida before Islam had a certain structure. And in one part of the qasida, the poet would proclaim the virtues and the great exploits of one's tribe and one's forefathers as and ancestors. 
So these poets would celebrate the noble deeds, as I said, as well as the military exploits of their tribe and their, of their ancestors. So each tribe maintained some tradition of a descent from a noble ancestor whose noble conduct was upheld by his descendants. And it would be a he. It was a patrilineal um, uh, system. That is to say, descent was seen through the male line. And this nobility, this ancestral generational tribal nobility, was the determining factor in the social and moral standing of any individual and, of course, collectively of that person's tribe. Those who could not boast of their forefathers in such a fashion, that is to say in poetic fashion, or at least cite poetry that would support the noble or the nobility and the noble deeds and virtues of one's forefathers, such people who could not do so were of scant social standing and subject to contempt and derision. Such claims to nobility in Arabic are designated by the term hasab, hasabun, with a ha seen ba hasab. And this is a word that you find in other Islamic languages. It's there in Urdu as well. And the word hasab is related I um, mean, it's the root from which it comes. You can get other meanings out of that, such as to count or enumerate. And from this, we also get the word hisab. But here, if you want to have that sense, it would mean in the sense of the enumeration or recounting, so to speak, of the noble deeds of one's forebears. Now, here it is crucial to note that such nobility which was also called by the term in Arabic sharaf, were held to be hereditary. And it was believed by the ancient Arabs to be inherent in certain distinguished bloodlines, certain distinguished lineages. I will deal with this further shortly. Noble qualities, then, virtues, were held to be propagated through a certain stock or lineage or bloodline via a noble ancestor or ancestors. Such inherited nobility was held in the highest esteem, and nobility acquired by merely personal merit was held to be of little account. Such a pedigree of noble ancestors with virtuous deeds and valorous exploits was deemed in numerous examples of pre-Islamic poetry to be akin to a mighty and lofty structure. Thus, we have the famous pre-Islamic poet Labid ibn Rabi'a, who lived into the time of Islam and he became a Muslim later. But this is from his Mu'allaqa, which was composed before Islam in the Jahiliyyah. So he says there, وَإِذَا الْأَمَانَةُ قُسِّمَتْ فِي مَعْشَرٍ أَوْفَى بِأَوْفَرِ حَظِّنَا قَسَّامُهَا فَبَنَا لَنَا بَيْتًا رَفِيعًا سَمْكُهُ فَسَمَا إِلَيْهِ كَهْلُهَا وَغُلَامُهَا Which means, and when trustworthiness was portioned out amidst the assembly of men, the apportioner afforded us an abundant portion. So he's claiming for his tribe that they have more trustworthiness, more lo- um, uh, honesty, more loyalty than other tribes. In the next verse it says, Thus did he raise for us a lofty, firm edifice. And the word used in Arabic is baytun a lofty, firm edifice to which young and old aspired to rise up to. So such virtue, such virtuous uh, qualities were deemed to be hereditary, uh, propagated through certain bloodlines, 
and it, it was held, as indicated in this line of poetry, to be a kind of firm structure. And this structure symbolically was, you know, very high, and both young and old aspired to rise up, as it were, uh, to this structure. Now, here in the same poem, in a few lines before, two absolutely fascinating terms in Arabic come into play in the same qasida or ode of Labid. The first is the term sunnah, which often meant before Islam ancestral nobility and virtues as a tradition to be upheld and adopted by the descendants. It's important to understand this. So sunnah, of course, later in the Islamic period means the practice of the Prophet Muhammad And of course, the Prophet Muhammad is of very virtuous and, and noble lineage. And of course, his sunnah, the tradition which he establishes, is to be upheld by those who come after him. But before Islam, there was a sunnah in each tribe. You see, there was this notion that there was a kind of ancestral nobility of and virtue which becomes a tradition to be upheld and adopted by the descendants of the tribe. So, Labid says in the same poem, مِن مَعْشَرٍ سَنَّةِ لَهُمْ آبَاؤُهُمْ وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ سُنَّةٌ وَإِمَامُهَا Aha! From those for whom their forefathers established a tradition of noble deeds, the Arabic is sunnah, and every people has its tradition, its sunnah, and guide. And the word used is imam. That's the second word. So we have the term sunnah and the word imam in this very interesting poem by Labid ibn Abi Rabi'ah before Islam. So this is the second term, the term imam. So we have sunnah as well as imam. I think that that is very, very interesting. Thus, we see in this line of poetry that everybody of noble deeds establishes a tradition by one's forefathers and has an imam who embodies it and who is to be followed as an example. I would argue that we have here in this line of poetry a precursor of the notion of imam as a guide, which of course would be later elaborated upon in Quranic usage and in prophetic practice. There is an additional term in addition to sharaf and hasab, and that is the notion of irqun, irq, ain, ra, qaf. Irq meant the ability to trace qualities and morals and virtue backwards through the family tree. And irq then has the sense of a root or origin of a person. Now, those are the notions then of, 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 of tribal nobility, of a hereditary character. Now, the ancient Arabs were, in addition to being differentiated into nomadic and sedentary groups, they were also differentiated by geography. So we have the northern and central Arab tribes of whom the Quraysh was the most important grouping. People often have the idea that Quraysh is a tribe. In fact, it was a group of tribes. It's a designation for more than one. It was a tribal um, confederation. But this grouping of tribes known as the Quraysh was the most important one in northern and central Arabia and, and was also the most dominant. In South Arabia, ah, and also in Northern Arabia and Central Arabia, you had both sedentary and nomadic groups, whereas in South Arabia, it was a sedentary society. Uh, Southern Arabia is, is, is um, parts of it anyhow, are characterized by sufficiently abundant rainfall that make um, the trapping of rain possible and can therefore facilitate a sedentary lifestyle based on a kind of irrigation-based agriculture. And this is the kind of society that you had in South Arabia, and they used to build structures. And so their lifestyle was 
quite different in that way from northern and central Arabia. Um, and this also had an influence on the kind of society and the kind of notions that emerged in, uh, in both areas. So in north and central Arabia, despite the notions of hasab and sharaf and irq that we have already talked about, the concept of um, tribal authority, of leadership, was often based not on these notions as such, but on seniority of age and perceived ability in leadership. Northern Arabian tribes also boasted of their courage and victories in battle and did not typically ritually thank their deities for such blessings and favors. In contrast, South Arabian tribes always would make votive offerings. They would make an off some kind of a, an offering to their deities for such blessings. Now, the South Arabian tribes also had a system of sacred kingship in which there was a hereditary succession based on hereditary sanctity. And the king was a kind of sacred king, a kind of priest king who also served a kind of sacred function. Very similar to like the sacred function of the emperor in ancient Japan in as much as it was by, by the very wujud, the very existence of that monarch who, who would perform the necessary rituals that the crops would actually grow and that the cosmos would continue to function. So there was a similar notion uh, in ancient South Arabia, the, uh, the notion of sacred kingship, the notion of hereditary succession and sacred bloodlines and hereditary sanctity. It is extremely important to note that the tribes who were settled in Medina in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, namely Aus and Khazraj, had migrated to to Medina. Ancient name of Medina being Yathrib, they had migrated to Yathrib, and they were originally of South Arabian origin, specifically of Yemenite origin. Thus, they naturally, once Islam was proclaimed, understood Islam to be a religio-spiritual teaching as well as a political movement. The northern Arabs, I would argue, on the other hand, at least in the initial stages of the message of Islam and their acceptance of it, saw it as a socio-political movement rooted in the religious the religion, excuse me, taught by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, this, despite the fact that each of these northern and central Arabian tribes had a tribal deity, and that tribal deity was symbolized in a sacred stone called nasabun or nusbun, from the Arabic nasaba to erect or raise up, and such a sacred stone would be designated the lord of its respective temple. There were these tribal places of veneration, and that place of veneration or temple would be called a bait, al-bait. And the lord of that temple would be called rabbul bait. And so the ancient Arabs would refer to the lord of this temple or this house, and they would say, rabbu had al-bait, a phrase which also occurs later in the Quran in reference, of course, to the Kaaba. So these temple sanctuaries, which in Arabic, even before Islam, were known as haram, as inviolate places, were under the custodianship and guardianship of certain tribal clans who acted as guardians of these sanctuaries. Very important. These guardian clans were seen to have a sanctity which was hereditary in the same fashion as the sacred kingship of the southern Arabs. However, for the northern Arabs, such clans formed a kind of tribal, spiritual aristocracy and did not necessarily exercise leadership over the whole tribe. This kind of tribal, spiritual aristocracy in each in the case of each tribe, was known by a special term. That term 
was Ahlul Bayt. Now the Kaaba was the most important of such temples. It was the premier house of God, Baytullah. And all the tribes recognized its association with the noble ancestor, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, and his son Prophet Ismail. And this is something which on which there was no disagreement at all. All of the pre-Islamic tribes of Arabia acknowledge this and it is there in ancient Arabian historical tradition. In the case of the Kaaba, it was the Banu Hashim, which was the clan which held the guardianship of this house, this temple, this bait. And they, the Banu Hashim, were regarded as its Ahlul Bayt. Now, in this connection, you have to understand the uh, matter of genealogy. The um, guardianship of the Bayt, the Baytullah in Mecca, <clears throat> the Kaaba, had certain duties and privileges, namely the supplying of food and water, the granting of hospitality to the pilgrims. And again, this pilgrimage was also universally associated by the pre-Islamic Arabs with Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam and Hajar alayhi salam. These privileges and duties were known as the siqaya and the rifada in Arabic, and simply <clears throat> the giving of hospitality in the form of <clears throat> food, water, provision <coughs> to the pilgrims. And these privileges were held at least since the time of Abd Manaf. So the genealogy of the Prophet you have to understand. So he would be the um, the great, great, great grandfather three times of the Prophet Muhammad So we have Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abd Manaf and so on. <clears throat> Going all the way back to, in fact, the Prophet Ibrahim through Ismail. Therefore, in view of all that I have said thus far, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, should later have appointed Ali in obedience to divine command, as we the Shia uphold, to be his successor, is not at all surprising, given the notions of inherited ancestral nobility, the notions of sharaf, hasab, irq, sunnah, the guardianship of the divine temple, with the hereditary sanctity, the notion of Ahlul Bayt, and that these qualities are personified in a particular individual known as the Imam. And indeed, we find the very same pattern in the Qur'an itself when Allah speaks of the special favor conferred upon the um, selected descendants, not exclusively, but selected descendants of the prophets, alayhim wassalam. And here there are four terms which are extremely important. Four terms in particular. They are dhurriyatun, alun, ahlun, and qurba. Four terms. The term dhurriyatun means one's offspring, means offspring or progeny, and it occurs in the Qur'an uh, about, uh, occurs in the Qur'an 32 times. Then we have the term al, and al means the near or nearest relations by descent from the same father or ancestor, and that occurs in the Qur'an 26 times. Then we have the term ahl, and ahl, uh, the meaning changes according to context many times in various senses. Um, it can mean the people of a town or the people of a place. And for our purposes, that's only one occurrence which is uh, relevant to our discussion. And that is along with the word al-bayt as the form ahlul bayt. 
which of course is in Surah Al-Ahzab. And then there is the term Qurba, and Qurba again are the very near relations, and that also uh, occurs once. So if we look at the occurrence of the term Dhurriya, I think it's very interesting. So uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that's the second Surah, uh, verse 124, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِذِ بَتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّ هُنَّ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي قَالَ يَا لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِي الظَّالِمِينَ When his Lord tested Abraham with certain words and he fulfilled them, he said, I am making you the imam of mankind. Said he, and from among my descendants, he said, my pledge does not extend to the unjust. This is the translation by Ali Quli Qarai of the Quran into English. We have another usage in Surah Ibrahim uh, when Ibrahim was settling Hajar alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam in the ancient valley of Bakka, as it's known by its ancient name. He said he 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 supplicated to God. He said, "Rabbana inni askantu min zurriyati." Our Lord, I have settled part of my descendants biwadin ghayridhi zar'in in a barren valley in the baytikal muharrami rabbana by your sacred house, our Lord, liyuqimu salah that they maintain the prayer faj'al af'idatan min al-nasi tahwi ilayhim so make the hearts of a part of the people fond of them warzuqhum min al-thamarat la'allahum yashkurun and provide them with fruit so that they may give thanks. So here again, Ibrahim a.s. is beseeching God that the favor conferred upon him and his de- uh, continue through his immediate descendants and their descendants. Um, however, in the previous verse which I read where he says, where he beseeches God about his descendants, Allah makes it clear that his extension and, uh, and perpetuation of this kind of nobility in the form of the imamate, I am making you uh, the imam of mankind. Inni ja'aluka nasi imama. He said, "Qala la yanalu ahdi al-zalimin." My pledge does not extend to the unjust. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's another. Yes, I would say there is another important and relevant one. Um, so, for example, in Surah Maryam. In uh, let's say yes, fifty-six to about fifty-eight, says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيسٍ إِنَّهُ كَانَ الصَّدِيقَ النَّبِيَّ وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ آدَمْ And mentioned in the book Idris, he was indeed a truthful man and a prophet, and we raised him to an exalted station. They are the ones whom Allah has blessed from among the prophets of Adam's progeny. And it goes on. Um, <coughs> in the case of the term Al, we have Surah An-Nisa, verse 54. أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا or do they envy those people for what Allah has given them out of his bounty? We have certainly given the progeny of Abraham the book and wisdom. The Al of Ibrahim have been given the book and wisdom, al-kitab wal-hikmah, and we have given them a great sovereignty. وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ mulkan azima. Of course, that's not everyone, because the Banu Umayya are also descended through Ibrahim. So it's, it's very clear, it's very interesting that it's only people who who uphold a certain who uphold themselves to that tradition of nobility, that sunnah, and the pre-Islamic and Islamic uh, senses of the term. When it comes to qurba, um, we have of course Surah Shura, the forty-second Surah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ذَلِكَ الَّذِي يُبَشِّرُ اللَّهُ عِبَادُهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى that is the good news that Allah gives to His servants who have faith and do righteous deeds. Say, I do not ask you any reward for it except the love of my relatives. And of course, last but not least, there is the last part 
of the 33rd surah, of the 33rd chapter, namely Al-Ahzab, Surah Al-Ahzab, the famous ayat Al-Tathir, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهَ نِيُذَبْ عَنْكُمْ وَرِجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهْرِكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا I think everyone who is listening to this lecture is aware of this verse. Now, there is a very important study, and in fact, really all I'm presenting you is a kind of a rehash of this information. This is a very unfortunate fact that this is a, a, a book which has been deeply neglected, and this is the book called Origins and Early Development of Shia Islam by Sayyid Hussein M. Ja'fari. It was published in Beirut in 1990 by Librairie du Liban, um, and he was a very a great scholar, actually, originally from Lucknow, and uh, he went on to teach at the American University of Beirut, and he wrote this very important study. And unfortunately, it has been very much neglected. So in the light of what we have said thus far, I would like to quote something which he wrote. He says, he's referring here to the clans of Abu Bakr and Omar. He said, neither Banu Taym ibn Murra, that's the clan of Abu Bakr, nor Banu Adi ibn Kaab, the people of Omar, the clan of Omar, had ever been regarded with esteem on any religious grounds. Thus, those who laid stress on the religious principle could not accept them as candidates for succession to Muhammad. In other words, those people, especially people from southern Arabian origin, who had a notion of a religious and spiritual notion of succession, could not accept them. He goes on, the candidate, in other words, for such people, could come only from the Banu Hashim. And amongst them, the figure of Ali was by far the most prominent. He too was the great grandson of Hashim and the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. He was the son of Abu Talib, Muhammad's uncle, who had given the Prophet the care and love of the father Muhammad had lost before birth. Ali was the nearest and closest associate of Muhammad for the Prophet had acted as his guardian during the famine of Mecca, and he had subsequently adopted him as a brother both before the Hijrah and again in Medina. He was the first male to embrace Islam, Khadija being the first woman. He was also the husband of Fatima, السلام, the Prophet's only surviving daughter, and by her fathered two of the Prophet's grandsons, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, both of whom Muhammad وسلم, loved dearly. So there can be no doubt about the special merits and favors of Ali. And indeed, over the centuries, hundreds of hadith scholars hundreds of, have authored hundreds of works enumerating the manaqib, the uh, great qualities and exploits of Imam Ali alayhi salam. It's very un important to understand all of this background if you really want to understand what happens much later in Karbala. So among these merits and special favors and qualities, I would single out six in particular. There is that of the uh, da'wah of the al-ashira. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he of course, he, as, it's, as, as we just read in that extract, he adopted the Prophet, he, the Prophet وسلم, um, adopted Ali, uh, um, in his childhood also, you see, um, because of um, repeated uh, uh, famines and, and uh, stresses that were taking place in Mecca, and the fact that his uncle Abu Talib had a large family, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, undertook taking care of Imam Ali on his behalf. And <clears throat> there is a verse in the Quran where um, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is then called upon to invite his whole clan and invite them uh, to um, to Islam, and that's in twenty six two fourteen. It's a very famous, um, a very famous uh, uh, event, and then the uh, the meal is presented, and the Prophet sallam asks, you know, who is going, who agrees to be my successor, and executor and um, uh, legatee and so forth. And Ali, of course, comes forward and he was quite young at the time, nine or ten years old. And so even there, there is this this designation of Imam Ali alayhi salam in front of uh, the entire tribe. 
Um, and then, of course, after the Hijra to Medina, there was something called the Muakha, or the kind of brotherhood pact. So all of the people who migrated from Mecca to Medina were to take on a kind of brother, uh, were to were to take on the, the migrants in, in, in a kind of foster kind of relationship, fraternal kind of relationship. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, took, in distinction to anyone else from Medina, uh, from the Ansar, he took Ali as his uh, brother, and of course he's already his cousin brother anyhow. Um, Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was also the standard bearer at the Battle of Badr and Khaybar. And there is the highly significant, highly significant, to which I gave an entire, entire lecture. Um, this is the fourth thing I'm singling out. And that is prior to the Prophet Muhammad sallam's departure on the Tabuk campaign, he appointed Ali as his deputy over Medina. And he said to him um, that your relation to me, your station in relation to me is like the station or rank of Harun to Moses. And this is extremely important because to this day in the Jewish religion, the descendants of Aaron, uh, of Aaron or Harun have a priestly and sacred kind of character. In the kind of worship which was established um, uh, after uh, uh, the Jewish religion was uh, uh, built a temple, there was a kind of temple service, a temple worship. But before that, as the ancient Jewish tribes were, were moving around in, in, in nomad nomadic existence, they had a special tent in which they kept the tabut or the ark. And only the descendants of Aaron were allowed to come near the ark. And that is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. And it's interesting that in the Abbasid period, there was a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Arabic by a very famous Jewish rabbi who was originally from Egypt named Sa'ad al-Fayyumi. And in the verse from the Torah in question, he translates the word priest, which in Hebrew is Kohen. The descendants of Aaron were called Kohanim. He translates that as Imam in Arabic. So I think that this is extremely important, and I think that many people have overlooked the importance of this hadith of the station of Aaron and, and have not really pondered it uh, very deeply. And if you do, then you see that the Harunic station or the manzila of Harun is that of the manzila of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and it's a very interesting parallel. The fifth um, quality I would single out is that when Surah Al-Bara'ah or Surah At-Tawbah, the ninth surah of the Qur'an, was revealed, it's a special sort of message, especially to the idolaters, the polytheists, the mushrikun. Um, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam wanted to dispatch the message of Surah Al-Bara'ah or Surah At-Tawbah to them in Mecca. At that time, the pilgrimage was taking place and Abu Bakr had been appointed to lead the caravan of the pilgrimage to Mecca. And he wanted to dis dispatch this surah to the Meccans, and he sent it with Ali, not with Abu Bakr. And of course, the sixth and final one I would like to mention is, of course, the hadith of Ghadir Khum, with which all of the Shia are very, very, very well acquainted. On the farewell pilgrimage, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stopped on the way back at a very important um, oasis or watering hole known as Ghadir Khum. And there he recited the famous words, Man kuntu mawlahu fa'aliun mawlah. And there is no dispute about this. Many, many books were written about it. It's been transmitted by more than a hundred companions. And um, in fact, even a very early hadith transmitter compiled an entire book about it, which was lost. His name was Ibn Uqda al-Kufi. The book has been reconstructed. The great uh, tafsir scholar, At-Tabari even uh, wrote a very large work on it. At-Tabari died in 310 of the Hijra. That work also has been lost, but the Hadith is very, very well known and is uh, there in all of the most important sources of Hadith of the Sunnis as well. So there's no dispute about that. They just dispute on what the word Mawla means. <laughs> so in light of all of this, it is no surprise that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi should appoint Ali ibn Abi Talib as his successor. And it is also, also in the light of everything we have said, it is also no surprise that certain tribes, certain figures in certain of, who came from certain tribal backgrounds opposed this succession. They opposed it tooth and nail. 
because it upset the entire balance uh, of, of, of tribal control, which was in place. And that, of course, came to a head after the death of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with the events at the Saqifah, which we will look at in the next lecture. And again, I would like to emphasize that the Prophet وسلم, appoints Ali through a divine command. Because in the final analysis, it is Allah who appoints the Khalifa. And this notion of a kind of nobility which is transmitted through a bloodline is further elaborated also in the hadiths of our imams as well. So the sixth imam, al-imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhim as says this, نحن بنو هاشم وشيعتنا العرب وسائر الناس الأعراب Imam Jafar Sadiq salam said we are the descendants of Hashim our supporters our Shia are Arabs of noble lineage and the others are desert Arabs of low descent and there is this notion which is developed in other hadiths. I could cite more hadiths, but in the interest of brevity, I will give just one more that indicate that those who truly follow the, this message of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, <clears throat> they and they alone are truly human. And those who rebel, who make mischief in the earth, who go against these teachings, have fallen away from their humanity to a kind of subhuman or infrahuman level. And in this regard, Imam Hussein himself says the following, and it's interesting, I'm condensing it a bit, but this was a question which was asked of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and Imam Hussein of course was still much younger at the time, and Imam Ali alayhi salam says to, motions to Imam Hussein, he says, answer the person. He asked him, what are, you know, what is a human being? Who are true and genuine human beings. And Imam, uh, Imam uh, Hussein alayhi salam said, فَنَحْنُ النَّاسِ أَشْبَاهُ النَّاسِ فَهُمْ شِيَعَتُنَا وَهُمْ مِنَّا النسناس فَهُمْ السَّوَادُ الْأَعْظَمُ وَأَشَارَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَى جَمَاعَةِ النَّاسِ Both of these hadiths are in uh, Rawdat al-Kafi. The second one means, we the impeccable ones, you know, the ma'sumun, the Masumin, if you prefer, are the human beings. Those who resemble human beings are our supporters, our Shia, our Mawali, who are our friendly allies, and come from us. The monsters with a human appearance are the great majority, and he, Imam Hussein, pointed to the mass of people. It is thus that we can understand what happened with Imam Hussein alayhi salam when he stood on the plains of Karbala when he was faced by the army of Yazid according to the maqtal known as al-malhuf by Radiuddin Ali ibn Tawus, a kind of dialogue took place between Imam Hussein alayhi salam and the army of Yazid. It says that he came out before the assembled ranks and leant upon his sword and he said with the loudest voice, أُنْشِدُكُمُ اللَّهَ هَلْ تَعْرِفُونَنِي By Allah, I earnestly, I earnestly urge you to speak the truth and answer me. Do you not know who I am? قَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ نَعَمْ أَنْتَ إِبْنُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَسِبْطَهِ The army of Yazid said, By God, of course we know. You are the son of the messenger of Allah and his maternal grandson. Again, I adjure you, speak the truth. Do you not know? 
that my grandfather is the messenger of Allah? Again, they say, by God, we know. أُنْشِدُكُمُ اللَّهَ هَلْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ أُمِّي فَاطِمَةِ بْنَةُ مُحَمَّدِ Speak the truth and tell me, do you not know that my mother is Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad? فَقَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ نَعَمْ And they said, by God we know. أُنْشِدُكُمُ اللَّهَ هَلْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ أَبِي عَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ Again, speak the truth and tell me, do you not know that my father is Ali ibn Abi Talib? Again, they said, by Allah, we know. أُنْشِدُكُمُ اللَّهَ هَلْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ جَدِّي خَدِيجَةَ بِنْتِ خُوَيْلِدْ أَوَّلُ النِّسَاءِ Again, I ask you, speak the truth. Do you not know that my grandmother is Khadija, daughter of Khuwailid, the first of the women to accept Islam? Again, they say yes. And it continues this way. And every time Imam Hussein alayhi salam is appealing to them and saying, do you not know I am this? Do you not know that I am that? Do you not know my lineage? He is appealing to this lineage. And every time, every single time, they say yes. And every single time they respond in the affirmative. And yet they still killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So this points to fundamental difference in the understanding of the nature of things. A fundamental difference in the understanding of who Imam Hussein alayhi salam was and what his lineage represents. Why is it, you may ask yourself, that they had to massacre everyone? I don't know if you've ever thought about it. If it was simply a political dispute, as most would lead us to believe, then it's enough just to kill Imam Hussein salam and leave. Why does... Uh, a practically newborn nursing infant have to be shot through the neck? And then why do the heads have to be chopped off and taken and marched off to Damascus as proof that these people were killed? It is because Yazid knew that he represented the counterfeit version of the religion of Muhammad a nuskhatul muzayyifa as we would say in Arabic, the counterfeit coin. And the only way that he could gain any legitimacy was to wipe off from the face of the earth the source of all walaya, of all nearmostness to God, of all sanctity, the very personification of sharaf and hasab and nasab and irq, to wipe off the face of the earth the ahl al-bayt. That is why he did what he did. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيِّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ